good morning and welcome to Kennesaw Family Life Church Online. We're excited you chose to join with us today. If you've not been with us before, here are Jennifer and Jocelyn with The The Tour. Tour. (laughs) All right. And I hope Robbie includes the yay. It's been a brand, it's a brand new year, so it's a brand new tour. Woohoo! Although we're going to go through it really fast for you. If you've never been here before, we want to introduce you to the platform just a little bit. The wide world. So over here or down here if you're on your mobile device, Mm -hmm. there is a chat. Chat. That yes. is correct for 100 points. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. A chat window, please, please take a moment to say hello in the chat so that we know you're here and can greet you in yeah. real time. Exactly. And then we also have tabs within the chat. So That's there's right. the chat tab, which you'll start out on. We also have a Bible tab available. So if mm-hmm. you want to look up and follow along with the sermon and stuff. It's pretty much your version is on that Bible tab, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the notes tab which is very handy dandy if, again, you want to follow along, but you cannot print those if you would like to print your notes. You can go up to the top of the screen here, and on the, the, you see some buttons at the top of the screen, you go to our website, and right at the very top of the website, you'll see a little PDF guy, and uh, you can click on that. It opens up a PDF with printable notes. All right. So there you go. Um, that is that is the notes button up there. There's also some more buttons up here. We have mm-hmm. our giving button. Indeed. Uh, if you want to give as your form of worship with your tithes and offerings, mm-hmm. um, you click on that. It takes you right to the website. Super quick. It really is. And it's even quicker. Like once you've done it once, it's like no time at all. <laughs> you just like put how much you want to give, click. That's good. Boom. We also have our volunteer opportunities up there. So the volunteer button, and that's mostly the waiver that you sign. For Forever Fed, yeah. Forever Fed. Yeah. There's there's other things. If you've never been to our brand new website, I don't know if you know, we redid the website. It's fancy. Uh, It's got lots of stuff on there for you. You can check it out while you're over in those buttons. It'll open a new window, and you can have the website open too. So Mm -hmm. that's the the new. Now we're gonna do something we do every week. We love to build community, get to know one another, especially with our online service. We do the same thing in our in-person service. We like to ask a question just to get to know each other a little bit better. Remember, we've got the chat down there that we want you to participate in. And our question for this week is, think about where you grew up. Maybe you grew up here, maybe you grew up somewhere else. But what was, something that the people you grew up with, the area you grew up with, did as fall activities. Maybe it's a particular event, maybe it's just something that people like to go and do, but what is something that you like to do where you grew up as a fall activity?
fall is such a great time. I, I think for me, where I grew up in Michigan, I think our, our some of our favorite fall activities was, believe it or not, after everybody had raked their leaves, we would have these crazy just bomb piles as kids, just jumping on the leaves and just going in there and throwing stuff everywhere. It was a lot of fun. That was probably our big thing. We would often go up and uh, get really probably the, the better answer is this going to the apple orchards and getting fresh, hot apple cider. Because in Michigan this time of year, it gets really cold. Now, we want to take a minute and go over what's happening this week with Kennesaw Family Life Church. If you've been with us for a while, you know that Monday through Thursday at 7.14 a.m., we have prayer on Zoom. This is something we've done since COVID. It was something we instituted during COVID to kind of keep people connected and to pray for one another because the Bible tells us to. And we have a list, a pretty good list of prayer needs that we would love if you have a prayer need, send it in and we'll get it added on there. But if you'd like to join us, we can send you that Zoom number. It's at 714 on Zoom, lasts about 15, 20 minutes. And then we get on with our day. And that's 714 a.m., by the way. We do it early in the morning. Also, on Wednesday night, it's our game night. We love game night. It's going to be at desktop co-working where the church meets. You'll have to come in, let us know when you're there, come in the side door. But here's the thing. This is our special candy game night. What does candy game night mean? We want you to bring candy to share so that we can try different candies. If you make candy, man, I'd love to see that. I know some people make their own candy. So it's our candy game night. Last month it was chilly. If you missed that one, it's always a fun time. But this time we're going to have a candy theme. So we'd love for you to bring your favorite candy with you. Bring enough to share and be a part of our game night. It's open to anyone. We have all different kinds of games. It's a lot of fun. Then Thursday morning, 7.30 a.m. at Honeysuckle Biscuit and Bakery, right downtown. Our guys get together and we drink coffee or chai lattes, some people get some food, and we just hang out and get to know each other better, share stories, it's a lot of fun. So if you're a guy and you'd like to come join us, or if you're a girl and you just wanna crash and say, hey, that happens occasionally, we'll be there from 7.30 till about 8.30, nine o'clock, right in that range. Then this Saturday, we have our craft connection at 10 a.m. at Swift Cantrell Park. So if you're interested in crafts, come on over. We do different crafts every month. And so 10 o'clock at Swift Cantrell Park. If you want more information, you can call us or email us. We can give you some more details on that, but we'd love to have you join us. And then it's the last Sunday of the month, which means our Forever Fed Outreach is Sunday after church. Volunteers come at 3.30 to help set up. And we served 60... I think 67 families last month. There's a big need in our community. It's a mobile food pantry. We have community partners that come in and join with us and we give out food. It's basically like shopping. You just will fill a shopping list of food from our truck and put it in whoever's coming through his car. If you know somebody that needs food, tell them to come and they start lining up early. So put that on your calendar for next Sunday. We'd love to have you come and, and join with us at that. So that's our announcements for this week. Now we're gonna take a moment, we're gonna have a time of singing and worship, and we wanna transition into that time. And, and look, songs and music help to draw us into God's presence. It helps us to refocus. God gave us music to set the tone for what we're doing, and we're gonna take a moment and just sing together for a little bit. And I know you're at home. Sing where you're at. Worship with us in this. I want to pray over that worship time, and then we'll sing together. Let's pray. Father, we ask right now that you would move upon our hearts, that you would help us to clear out all the stuff in our life right now, that we would put it all aside and just focus on you for just a few moments. Lord, help us to sense your presence, to take the burdens that we have and lay them at your feet today. Lord, help us to worship together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God, we are so thankful for all that you've done for us, for all that you've given for us. Lord, we're thankful that we can come together and worship you freely today. Lord, that's what we do. We lift our voice. We lift our music to you. We lift our lives to you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Because he's given Jesus Christ. 
surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me Sing your goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me Yes, Lord Your goodness is running after It's running after me Surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so. As we transition from a time of singing and worship, we want to pray over the needs of our church. We want to make sure that we're lifting up our community partners, which are Raise the Bar Coaching, Community Bible Church, and Billy and Valerie Thomas. We want to pray over them. We want to pray over our offering today. Remember, that's a part of our worship. We get to give back to God. He's provided everything that we need and he will continue to provide for us and we need to be faithful and obedient in our giving we want to pray that god will meet the needs of this body there have been surgeries there's been people struggling and in, in the hospital for different things and we just want to pray that god will bring healing if you need prayer you can click that prayer button and it'll open up a separate window that'll allow one of our hosts to pray with you uh, or you can go to our website and always send us an email with your prayer request. We do pray during the week for our 714 prayer together. We would love to add that to the list. So let's pray over the needs together today. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for the opportunity to worship you and to come together, even if it's online. Lord, I pray over the needs of this church, over the needs of this community. Lord, we ask right now that you would meet every physical need that's out there. Lord, we rebuke cancer. We rebuke diabetes, high blood pressure, all of those things that attack our bodies. Lord, we ask right now that you'd bring healing from those things. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on us. We ask that you would touch our minds today. The enemy loves to attack our minds. That's actually his, his biggest area of focus. And, and if he can get us focused on all the wrong things, we lose heart, we come, become discouraged. And Lord, I pray right now that you would protect our minds, that you would, Lord, help those that are battling with anxiety, fear, depression, such debilitating things. And we ask right now that you'd bring joy and peace in the midst of difficult times. Lord, bring comfort and peace right now to those that are struggling. And Father, we pray over those that are struggling with financial issues 
Lord, your word tells us that when we are faithful, when we follow you, you will care for all of our needs. And Lord, we trust you right now with our finances and we ask that you would bless our offering, bless our tithes. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be good stewards of the money that we do have, the money that you've provided for us by giving us the ability to work. And, and Lord, we thank you for that. We pray right now over our community. We lift up our community partners. We lift up Raise the Bar Coaching. We ask that you would touch Joe Stockman and everybody that works with him. And Lord, the Community Bible Church, we pray over them. We pray that you give them favor in this community, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, guide and direct their words today. And Lord, we lift up our missionaries, Billy and Valerie Thomas. We ask that you would meet every need that they have, that you would lift every burden that they have and help them to minister and to encourage missionaries all over the United States. Lord, we thank you for this community. We pray over the mayor of Kennesaw, the city managers, the city council, our police and fire department, parks and rec department. Lord, we ask for your hand to be upon each one of them, that you would bless them and encourage them. What an amazing community we live in. Lord, we pray for our neighbors and our friends. We ask that you would help us to reflect you well, that we would draw others to you. Give us favor in this community, Lord, we ask. Go before us today. Open up our hearts to hear your word. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. We are excited to get started with our next installment or part three of the Against the Odds series, which is a walk through the letter to the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians was written by Paul. And, and just to give you a little background to kind of recap what was going on, Paul and Silas were sent out by the church. If you're familiar with church history at all, if not, that's fine. Paul was sent out right after uh, Jesus had died and rose again, and the church was getting established in Jerusalem and in that area. Paul was sent out to churches in Gentile areas. God was doing something new, just blowing the minds of the Jews by opening up the word of God to the Gentiles. And basically, a Gentile is just a word that means not a Jew. Really, anybody that's not Jewish is a Gentile. And they, for years, the Jews thought only God's promises related to them. But God was showing that through Jesus, he was for everybody. He wanted all of creation to come into relationship with him. So Paul and Silas were sent out to tell people about Jesus, to establish faith communities, to lead people to Christ in basically non-Jewish areas. Now, there were Jews there, there were temples, but generally it was Roman provinces and they were Greek and they were pagan and Gentile. So, so they were just a mix of people that, that Paul and Silas were sent out to. And God had led them in a dream, really, because they were going to go to Asia, but in a dream to go to Macedonia. And they, they hadn't been over there. And so they went. And over the last couple of weeks, we talked about on the way to Macedonia, or part of Macedonia was Philippi. And we know that there is a letter to the Philippians, one of my favorite of Paul's letters. But when they were in Philippi, Paul and Silas were there. They were ministering and, and developing this faith community and and through an incident where this girl that was demon possessed kept saying things and and it was really becoming difficult for Paul and Silas to do what God had called them to do and they cast the demon out of this girl and she was a slave and she was a fortune teller and when they cast the demon out she no longer could tell fortunes and the slave master got really angry worked up a mob and had Paul and Silas thrown into prison Really cool story. We read it last week. You can go back to last week's message. I'm not going to take the time, but long story short, while they were in prison, they were worshiping God and God sent an earthquake, freed all their chains, but they didn't leave. And the jailer was going to kill himself, but instead he came in and found all the prisoners there and actually believed on Jesus. And that's a, that's a much longer story, but really cool things. And then after they were released from prison, they were said, hey, you, you're free to go, but don't stay here and preach the gospel. Leave. Please leave. So Paul and Silas left, and they found themselves in Thessalonica. 
And while they were there, is this, you know, a part of Macedonia, they were there, they did what they normally do. They would go find some Jews because that was what they did. And they went to the temple. I don't know how big this temple was, but there was a place of worship for the Jews. They would go in and they would share the gospel. They would share who Jesus is, the good news. It's all gospel means is good news of Jesus, the Messiah, that God came to earth as man. And they would share about him. And this is what they did everywhere that they went. And there was, there were some Jews and some Greeks that were believing in who Jesus is. They were there three Sabbaths, so basically three weeks. And then people from Philippi that were per- persecuting them there came over and stirred up trouble for them in Thessalonica. And actually, Paul and Silas were staying with somebody that they had met there. They were living in their house. And this mob that they had worked up came and arrested the family that Paul and Silas were staying with, threw them in jail because of Paul and Silas, because they said they were causing riots and and going against Caesar, all of this stuff. And so eventually they were released from prison and and everybody, all the believers there after just a month said, hey, you guys need to, to move on so you don't end up arrested or killed. And so Paul and Silas went on to Berea, but they left in this church, this budding church that they'd only poured into for about a month began to grow. Here's what we know From what we've learned so far, we're only a couple chapters into this letter. The church survived against the odds. Let's face it, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a leader or a pastor. Paul and Silas were only there three weeks, maybe four. It was just a short period of time, but it survived. And it not only survived, but it thrived. It became an example for churches throughout Macedonia. The second thing we learned is that the Holy Spirit was the key to its survival. Paul and Silas, when they left, the church didn't have the Bible, didn't exist yet. They had, you know, if they were Jewish, they had the Old Testament scriptures that pointed to Jesus, but they didn't have what we know as the New Testament. Those letters had been written. This is one of those letters. So the Holy Spirit had to guide them, direct this young church. Here's the other thing. What Paul had suffered became proof of his pure motives. So Paul's suffering in Philippi, what they had, the opposition, they were doing this not to gain people's wealth, not to trick them into anything. They had pure motives. They loved the people that were there and they shared their lives with them. And their pure motives and obedience opened the door for the Holy Spirit to do his job. And out of that, a church was born. So that gives us some insight into what was going on. We're going to go a little deeper. That was... We talked about Paul's motives last week. Well, we're going to go a little deeper into that today. We're going to kind of complete that thought. And the first thing is, the first point is called working day and night. And and we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 through 11. This is where we're going to start. I titled this point, Working Day and Night. You're going to understand that in just a moment. But let's read 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. You yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. Did you catch that? They didn't want to be a burden. They worked day and night to fund themselves. If you've paid attention at all, we have tons of churches. Whether you're a Christian or not, whether you've been in church for a long time or not, we have, we have a lot of churches. And most of those churches have a paid staff there. Even if it's just the pastor, they're paid to do that. A lot of churches don't, but they were paid to do it. And that was okay. But Paul and Silas didn't ask for money. They didn't want that to become a barrier. See, sharing Jesus with the people, they went out and they were sent out to share the gospel. And it was their life. It wasn't just a career that they made money. They would work and do things to make money to earn so that they could do 
what God called them to do, which was to share Jesus with the people that was there. It was their life. It was a part of who they were. It wasn't a career choice. It was a life choice. So as followers of Jesus, it is our mission to share Jesus. It is our mission to make disciples. That's not a career. That's a part of who we are. Whether it's how we make money or not is irrelevant. Making disciples is a part of who we are. Actually, I think sometimes earning a living doing ministry can become a roadblock because then we tend to approach it like a business and we lose sight of loving and caring for people and we get focused on running a business and earning a living. And it can become a roadblock. Now, I'm not going to say that every pastor that gets paid for doing ministry has it wrong. That's not it at all. Um, <clears throat> look, there have been many years that Jennifer and I have done ministry where we've gotten paid to be on staff at a church. And then there have been many years that we've had to earn our living outside of the church to be able to do ministry. I tell people all the time, I've done a lot of different things to support my ministry habit, which is true. I do now. We, we earn income from a lot of different places to support our family as part of what God does for us. But each one of those are opportunities to pour into to people's lives. See, it wasn't an option for them to share the gospel. It was a mandate. It was a part of who they were. They were driven to do it. How they earned money how they made a living was God's way of them sharing the gospel. Now, I want you to understand something. Paul was not opposed to pastors and church leaders earning a living or earning money for doing that. He talks about this in Corinthians. Now, it's going to sound a little bit different. This was an established church that Paul had established in Corinth when he wrote the letter. And people were coming in and demanding money and using it for false purposes. So you listen to this a little bit. 1 Corinthians 9, 11 through 15, it says, Since we have planted spiritual seeds among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used that right. We would rather put up with anything than to be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge." Paul's boasting wasn't a pride thing. This was a common terminology of that time period. People would go out and boast about accomplishments. It was part of the debate culture that was in that area. But Paul was saying, look, the Lord ordered that those that preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Basically, if you're going to run a church, you should be paid for that. But yet, here's the thing. He said, I don't want that to become an obstacle. I don't want that to become something difficult. I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday, and one of the gentlemen that was leading that Zoom meeting, a church planner, which means basically they start churches, started a church in Philadelphia, was talking about how he was in this meeting, and this, and this pastor said, yeah, we have a $22 million mortgage. He said a $22 million mortgage you're not going to tell the truth. <laughs> and he said, he was joking about that. And it actually wasn't in that meeting. It was, it was an interview that I, I read with somebody else. But they were talking about that $22 million mortgage becoming a stumbling block because now they're preaching to get people just in the door and they didn't care if they were really sharing the gospel. They really just needed bodies in seats so that they could pay for the building. And it distracted from the gospel. Because now they don't have the freedom to preach the way they want, they, to preach on the hard things because if people get offended and leave, they can't pay for their building. It's a catch-22. And now I'm not saying every large building and all of these things are not of God. That's not what I'm saying at all. There's some really great large churches out there that do a good job. But here's the thing. We sometimes get caught up in the fact as pastors 
that in order to pay the bills of the church, when we've got buildings and all these things to worry about, that if we don't have people in the seats that are tithing, we don't get paid. So sometimes that changes the way you treat people. It changes the way you interact because your income's tied to that. Where Paul's saying, look, I've got the freedom. I'm not getting paid to do this. I can do this because I'm driven by God. If you choose to be offended by what I tell you, which is the word of God, that's not on me. That's on you. My income doesn't come from you. So I don't have to sit there and and coddle you to keep you in the door because it benefits me. Now, do I want anyone to leave? Absolutely not. But I also want to share the truth without wondering if it's going to offend somebody and they leave or get hurt or have hard conversations. It it becomes muddled. And And I know I'm being kind of transparent here, but that is kind of the downfall of earning a living from the church. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. And most churches and most pastors are sincere and, and they work really hard and they care about their community and they care about the people that they serve. But there's always a percentage that that's a distraction. And Paul, if you look back to the, the verses just before this, we talked about his pure motives, that he never came to ask them for money. He never demanded any of that from them because he didn't want to be a stumbling block. Speakers of that day would come in and they, and they would share, and we talked about this a little bit, it's kind of like a book tour, and they bring people in, and, and they do all of those things, one, to, to make money, to build their brand, to become something that would earn them money or earn them reputation. For some of them, it's not money, it's their own ego, it's their own building of themselves, and Paul's saying, look, we don't want any of that. We just want you to know Jesus. So we're going to give you our lives. We're not going to ask anything of you. We're not going to ask you to support us. Now, they were living with people in the church, and that was fine. But they went out and earned their own living. It's it's well documented in Acts chapter 18. Paul learned from Priscilla and Aquila to be tent makers, or they were already tent makers, which is really leather workers. They made these leather tents. Really cool thing. His motive was sincere. He modeled following Jesus. He modeled what it was look like to follow Jesus. Now for Jennifer and I, like I said, we've earned money from outside sources and we've earned money from the church. But for 28 years, this is our life. We don't ever see retirement's not an option, not because of financial things, but because we're always going to be telling people about Jesus. We're always going to be mentoring and drawing people into relationship with him. Now, how we do that will change over the years. But it's always going to be a part of our lives. Now, as a result of their diligence and obedience and their call to God, lives were changed and a church was born. Remember, we're first called to make disciples and the church will be born out of that. That's what they were doing. They were discipling the people that were there. When they left, this church was born. So the second thing in this, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 13, is earn a right to be heard. Earn the right to be heard. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 and 13. It says, We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For we called you to share in His kingdom and glory. Therefore, we never stopped thanking God that when you received His message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human words or ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which, of course, it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. I've said this many times over the years. We need to earn the right to be heard. It's a great little catchphrase, but what does that mean? It means that when we do life with someone, when we build relationship with them, we spend time with them, when we sit with them through difficult times, when we spend time with somebody, we earn the right to speak into their life. To be able to speak in their life, not to criticize and condemn. That's what I think some people think it is. Man, we get a lot of church busybodies that like to tell people how to live their lives and to point everything out. That's not what I'm talking about. Actually, 
earning the right to be heard is most of the time keeping our mouths closed until we're asked very specifically, hey, what do you think about this? Or can you pray with me about this? Man, I'm really struggling. I don't understand. It feels like everything's falling apart. And God opens up a door for us to have spiritual conversations. I was having a conversation with somebody this past week, going through a really difficult time. We were able to help that person a little bit financially to help them get through that season. And they said to me, you know what? I haven't been to church in a long time, and and I'd really like to sit down and just talk about spiritual things. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're hoping. We first do life with somebody. We first earn the right to speak into somebody's life, to show them that we love and care about them as people right where they're at in their mess, without condemnation, without criticism, without pointing out everything that's wrong, but just simply sitting with them and earning the right to speak in their lives. Paul and Silas did not demand anything. If you remember, Paul said they shared not only the good news, but their lives. They showed them that they loved them. And because they showed them their love, they were able to speak the truth of the gospel into their lives. Romans 12, Paul talks about this a little bit. In Romans 12, 9, it says, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Now think about this for a minute. We're told to love everybody. We don't have to like everybody, but we're told to love everybody. But showing somebody love means sitting with them through difficult times, means that you you care about them and you and you you speak to them in ways that shows them love, that encourages and builds them up, that you help them when they're in need, that you pray for them, that you care about their lives, that you share your life with them. So don't just pretend to love others, really love them. That's hard for us to do. Sometimes the best way I can speak into somebody's life is just to sit there with them. As a pastor, for years I really struggled because I felt like when people came and just poured out their lives to me that I had to have answers for everything that's there. And actually as a guy, and this is natural for guys to do, we like to fix things. If we if we see something that's going wrong, we want to provide solutions and fix things. And I have to temper myself sometimes and, and not try to fix every situation. But sometimes just to sit and listen because what the person really needs is to just dump it all out. And oftentimes in the dumping, they learn or the Holy Spirit reveals to them what they need to do. But we, we feel like if people would know our stuff and if we were to just dump it all out there that this person isn't going to like me, this person is going to push me away. Look, I have heard just about anything from people. Not very much surprises me anymore. After years of working in foster care and 28 years of ministry, I've heard it working with the police department. All of those things, I've seen and heard a lot of things. A lot of things that I can never share that are a pretty big deal. But what I've learned is, is that people need to get that off their chest. They need to share. And by just simply sitting with them and not necessarily offering solution, unless they ask, hey, what do you think about this? We earn the right to be heard. That's where that conversation is. Hey, what do you think I should do? How should I handle this? I'm I'm, I'm lost and broken. I see all the things that God's done in your life, but I don't have that peace. How do I get that peace? That's when you earn the right to speak into somebody's life. Remember, when we f- reflect Jesus, think about how Jesus confronted like the woman at the well. He shared with her things that he knew about her life and even pointed out that she was living in sin with somebody. He didn't condemn her. Actually, what he said was, go and sin no more. He said that to many people. He would point out their sin. Their sin, was, their sin became evident when they saw the truth, when they saw the love of Jesus. The sin became evident. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal that. To show that he didn't have to tell them you're evil sinner, you're going to be in hell or anything like that. He just simply had to love them and show them what the purity of of living for him or to reflecting him is. And go and sin no more. Let me help you with this. 
my experience has been this. Most people know where their sin is. Most people know what's causing them problems. And it, it, it brings them shame and it brings them hurt. That's why they hide it because they think if, man, if everybody knew all this stuff, they wouldn't like me. It's where the insecurity comes in, all of those things. And that's where people put on good faces. They'll lie and, and build up this persona that makes them look different than what they are. They, they project what they want people to see. But that deep hurt inside is often hidden. And what Jesus does is when he forgives us of that sin, he frees us up to be who he's called us to be. That doesn't mean you share all of your stuff with everybody. Not everybody needs to know that. But when you give somebody the ability and the freedom to open up their hearts, to pour out their lives, you earn the right to speak into their life, to have those spiritual conversations, to have those times where you introduce them to Jesus, the one that gives freedom and peace, the one that loves them exactly where they are. That's what I mean when I say they earn the right to be heard. The Holy Spirit convicts people. Like I said, my experience, most people already know where the issues are. They just need to get it out. It's not for me to point out to them. Actually, when Jesus did his Sermon on the Mount, he talked about, you know, get the log out of your own eye before you work on the speck in somebody else's. We're all broken. We all need that opportunity to share and to get it off our chest and to speak and to get the freedom that comes through Jesus. So Paul and Silas pled with them to live their lives in a way that honored God. Remember, this is an area that, that they were mostly Gentiles. They had a lot of different gods in the area and people worshiped idols. There were sacrifices. Remember in Corinth, there was temple prostitutes, all kinds of things going on. These, the pagan way of life went against the, the values of God, went against the word of God, but they didn't know any better. And so Paul and Silas shared with them what it meant to follow God, shared with them the truth of the gospel, and pled with them. If you look at verse 12, it says, We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives the way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and his glory, saying, Hey, let the Holy Spirit clean you. Get away from sexual immorality. Get away from worshiping idols and all of these other things. Live in a way that honors God. They were only with them a short period of time. They didn't have the Bible. All they had was the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6. This is going back to our first week. It says, For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power, for the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit, in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. From the Holy Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit was the key to this. The Holy Spirit was the one that convicted. The Holy Spirit was the one that took the words that Paul and Silas planted in their hearts and caused it to grow and blossom and to, for them to become basically the models for the whole region without anybody there molding them except for the Holy Spirit, which is awesome because the Holy Spirit does it way better than we can. Paul and Silas did their part by giving of themselves, sharing of their lives, being consistent, being obedient, so the Holy Spirit could do the work in their hearts. Look at verse 13. It says, Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received the message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. Again, the Holy Spirit. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which, of course, it is because it came from the Holy Spirit. It was planted into Paul and Silas by the Holy Spirit. And this word continues to work in you who believe. That's awesome. What an amazing thing. Which leads to our final point that Paul encourages them, which is imitating the believers. Imitating the believers. Basically, Paul and Silas, and he sent Timothy over there. There were different believers that came and they learned from their lives Look at verses 14 through 16. It says, And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. 
They fail to please God and work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God is caught up with them at last. Paul again talks about this opposition. He points out that when the church started in Jerusalem and throughout that area in the very Jewish area, that the Pharisees and those that were there tried to snuff it out. They, you go throughout the Bible, the Jews would often start straying away from God and God would send a prophet to correct their course. And we, we read the prophets and we celebrate the prophets, but they were lived very difficult lives and they were persecuted and often killed like John the Baptist. He was beheaded. Think about it. Read the story of Elijah. It came down to where all the prophets were killed and only Elijah was left. This was nothing new. And then when Jesus came and he shared the love, what did they do? They crucified him, but that needed to happen for our salvation. And then when the church was born, look at Paul before he became Paul. He was Saul. He was persecuting the church and throwing Christians in prison and having them martyred. All of those things were happening. This is not new. Now the gospel's going out to the Gentiles, going out into other areas. And the Jews that even started following Jesus would follow them over and start condemning them, persecuting them, having them thrown into jail, creating stories, lying about them so that they could stop what God was doing. This has happened. This is nothing new. And, and Paul was saying, look, you're imitating the believers that have gone before you in your suffering. You're imitating even Christ himself in your suffering. Well done. Hold on to your faith. You are on the right track. God is going to honor you. And actually, we know that they were known as believers to be modeled after throughout all of Macedonia. The Jews persecuted. Paul was persecuted. All of that was a part of their, their thing. You can find that same attitude today. There are people who do not believe that certain people deserve to know Jesus, even within our churches. And I can think of certain churches and even fellowships that are more about condemning people than they are about loving them and pointing them to Jesus. They point out, I, man, there are people that condemn either certain races or certain groups of people as if they're not worthy to hear the gospel. Well, none of us are. We're all broken. We, none of us deserve the gospel. But yet every human being that's ever been born, no matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what their background is, Jesus died for them. They deserve the right to have an opportunity to follow Jesus. It's not our job to clean up somebody's life and make them holy. It's our job to introduce them to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do His job, which is to clean them from the inside out. It's what He did for us. Now, we learn from other believers that model that lifestyle, and, and we learn from them, but they, they need to show that love and compassion. On the surface, people say the right things and, and all of those things, but they're so judgmental and, and condemning of people that people don't want anything to do with Jesus because they think, well, if that's what Jesus is, that's not love, that's, that's hate, that's, that's pushing people away. And I honestly, and this is just in my heart, I honestly think when those people stand before Jesus, I don't know what Jesus is going to do with them salvation-wise. That's not my job. But I, don't, I can't think that he's going to be proud of those things. I don't think he's going to celebrate those things. And in fact, the scripture says there are going to be people that said, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons for you. We did all of We preached your word. We did all of these things. He's going to say, I never knew you. And I think those that treat people in that way, that those that condemn people, because it's not our job to condemn. That's solely God's job. So I say woe to those that live in a way that condemn other people. Yeah, are there lifestyles of people that don't follow Jesus, that do not line up with his word? Absolutely. But we've been called to show them love to introduce them to Jesus, to draw them towards Jesus. And we can't do that if we're sitting there and pointing out all of these things in their life. All that does is push them away. Our job is to sit with them and love them and earn the right to be heard so that we can pour into their lives. 
Now, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be people that condemn us for what we do. There are going to be people even in the church body that are going to look and say, well, by loving these people, you're watering down the gospel. No, no, we're not. We're living out the gospel. There's always going to be people that condemn. There's always going to be people that tear down what God's doing. That's what the enemy does. He confuses. Even those that follow Jesus, he confuses them. Look, I was legalistic that way early on as a believer. I think it's easy to fall into. I know many of you were really legalistic. And, and man, you, you were, you're striving to live this holy life, which is part of the tension. But yet, when you look at people that are outside of that or are new believers... We feel like we have to demand to them to make them perfect right away. And that's not our job. Our job is to love them and show them through the way we live our lives. Show them how to live for Jesus. And when they ask the right questions, be ready to help them move closer to Jesus. So as we wrap up today, the bottom line is this. Our mission is to draw people to Jesus. Our mission is to love on a community and love on our people on people around us and everybody that God's put in our path and to draw them to Jesus, to introduce them to Jesus, to do our job out of obedience, to give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to do His. We do this first by being an example, which means we live our lives in such a way that we reflect Jesus well, that we try to strive to be holy in our own lives, not out of our own righteous piousness, but just in honoring God, not in looking down on people, but just because we want to honor God with our lives. We want to hear well done. We don't want to fall into sexual sin and be a stumbling block for somebody. See, doing those things, even though God's grace is there, we don't want to abuse that grace. So we want to move ourselves closer to Jesus every day. We do that by knowing Scripture, learning Scripture, letting it become a part of our lives so that we know what's right and wrong, so that the Holy Spirit spending time in prayer so that we can know God's voice and take advantage of opportunities so that He can correct the things in our lives. I promise you, God's always correcting things in my life. And I've been a Christian for a long time now, longer than I've not been. So we're consistently learning, we're consistently growing, we're, being, we're learning to be obedient and act upon His voice and to take advantage of every opportunity. That's the first thing, be an example. The second thing we can do is to build genuine relationships. Build genuine relationships with the people that God puts in our lives. Not to win them to Christ, although that is a part of our goal, but because we care about people. We sit down to get to know them, we sit down and... and are a part of their life. Look, there are a lot of people that I've had an opportunity to pour into over the years that have never come to my church, that have never sat and heard a message from me, but I've had an opportunity to be a part of their discipling process. And I'm okay with that. It doesn't matter whether they sit in my church or another church. What I care about is that they come to know Jesus and love Him. Would I love them to come to my church? Absolutely. I'd love to to have, I love fellowshipping with people and having them in our lives. But that's not my main goal. My main goal is to disciple and have the opportunity to pour into somebody's life to point them towards Jesus. That's my role. And it's not what I get paid to do. It is a part of who I am. Now, God provides everything I need so that I can do that. So I can have the freedom to do that. And the beauty of it is, is that in the midst of all this, I get to do some really cool stuff. And God has allowed me and and allowed Jennifer and I to do things that were beyond what we ever dreamt or imagined. Which is awesome because God wants us to have a life of joy. He wants us to have a life that's full. When we put our trust in Him, He will not only give us the desires of our heart and just pour it into us and make us content, and give us peace, but it also give us opportunities to share that love with other people, to share joy and to draw them to Him. So let's live our lives in a way that reflects Jesus. Let's in ourselves grow closer to Him. Let's know His Word, study it, get to know it. Please don't let this be the only time you read Scripture this week. Dig into it for yourself. Ask questions, learn and grow. 
Learn to hear the voice of God. And then love on whoever God puts in your life. You can't love everybody. You're not going to have a thousand relationships and disciple a thousand people. Jesus only took 12. Really, 12 is about the most that anyone can handle. And really pour into. Most of us have three or four people in our lives that we spend a lot of time with. Take advantage of every opportunity. Love on the people that God's put in front of you. Earn the right to be heard in somebody's life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I pray that you would just pour your spirit into us. Lord, we need your cleansing. We need to know you more. We need to hear your voice. Lord, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for the things that have become stumbling blocks in our lives and stumbling block to others. Help us to be a little more like you today. Help us to grow and give us a passion to love on people. Help us to know when to keep our mouths shut and when to speak. Fill us with your spirit so that we can speak words of knowledge and words of wisdom so that we can have the tools that we need to speak into people's lives. Lord, help us to take advantage of every opportunity. Lord, help us to build relationships. Show us who we can build those relationships with. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I pray that your hand would be upon each one of us today, that we would find joy and peace in you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We love you. If, you're, if you have questions, please click the, the prayer box down there and, and, or just click chat and we'd love to talk to you about it. If you have questions, remember that the service will be open for a few more minutes. And again, man, you can go on YouTube and find past messages if you missed something. We love you and we'll see you again next week. Again, we want to thank you for worshiping with us. I just want to remind you really quick of what we have going on this week. Again, 714 in the morning, Monday through Thursday, we have prayer on Zoom. Wednesday night, candy game night. We're excited about that. We'd love to have you join us. Honeysuckle Biscuit and Bakery for our guys at 7.30 a.m. on Thursday. Also, Craft Connection in Swift Cantrell Park Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And then our Forever Fed Outreach follows the service at 3.30 next Sunday. So the last Sunday of the month. We'd love to have you be a part of any of those activities. If you have questions, please just message us. We'd love to talk to you. We hope you have an amazing week and we'll see you again next time.